the Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy, brought to you today by Josh Edison and Dr. M. Denton. Hello and welcome to the Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy. It's night time in Auckland, New Zealand. I am Josh Edison and sitting next to me... Is the Master of the Night. Also, Dr. Dr. M. R. Yes, yes. yes. You might be Not wondering. a vampire. Mm. As far as we know. But as far so as you far, know. it is the night time, so you can explain your usual lack of bursting into flames as simply not being exposed to the harmful rays of the sun. Is there garlic in that whiskey? <laughs> There's never garlic in the whiskey. How convenient. It's true, How it is convenient. convenient that scotch doesn't contain garlic in it. Mm. I don't even know of any garlic finished whiskies because that would be horrific. If you know of a garlic finished whiskey, Please do send it along to the podcaster's guide to the conspiracy. I will drink it on air. These are pre-records, mm. and I will tell you that it's revolting because it will be. But I missed to try. Almost it. certainly. Will you just take your sip there? I'm just going to surreptitiously see if you cast a reflection in the surface of the liquid there. <laughs> it's marginal. I don't know. I don't know. So perhaps we'd better rush on with the the episode before your base instincts overwhelm you and you drink, drink more deeply whiskey. from the. Yes, yeah, yeah, the whiskey. Yep, from the whiskey. The whiskey. Uh, so I don't think we have any housekeepy, interesting thingies to say before we not at all into the news. No, so we're just casting aspersions on my non-vampiric character. Mm, non-vampiric. Maybe you should eat, just you should eat more garlic before you turn up for these podcasts. So you can just breathe in my face. Not a bad idea, actually. Not a bad I like idea. garlic. It's very tasty. We should mm. have garlic bread on this podcast. It's exactly the sort of thing a vampire would say to throw us off the scent. They want to suck your blood. That's exactly the sort of thing a vampire would say. Yes, but it's also the kind of thing a vampire wouldn't say because they'd want to distract you from the fact they are a vampire. So by claiming I want to suck your blood means I'm not a vampire. If I didn't want to suck your blood, that would prove I am a vampire. I can't fault your logic, I can't understand your logic, but I can't fault it. So I think we're logic, safe to move to on to the Doctor news. Doctor Who gives you the authority to be wrong. Mm. And now the news. Breaking, breaking, conspiracy theories in the news. First up, some gaming news. Uh, because we are down with the kids, with our, with our PewDiePie and our Ninja and our Five Nights at Freddy's live streaming. Uh, anyway, being down with the kids means that we're also down with Minecraft, and thus au fait with Minecraft and its creator, Marcus Notch Pearson, uh, who recently endorsed QAnon on Twitter. On March the 2nd, Notch tweeted, Q is legit. Don't trust the media. Which led QAnon supporters thanking Notch incessantly, and many of Notch's followers tweeting, so what? Uh, Notch followed up his initial tweet by admitting that Q's predictions aren't exactly predictive, um, and that really he was more interested in the way in which Q reveals the deep connections and politics between the rich and powerful. Uh, which, as our own Dr. Dentith has pointed out, might be a lesson QAnon followers are now learning, but it isn't exactly news to people who've been studying politics for a while. Uh, Notch has form for endorsing views associated with the alt-right. He's tweeted that it's okay to be white, uh, and asked why there isn't a heterosexual Pride Day, um, and argued that there is a definite agenda against white men in the media. So endorsing Q in the QAnon movement is, is actually par for the course, I think, for the creator of Minecraft. Also, Notch is now saying that trans activists want to make it illegal to use the wrong pronouns, which A, isn't true, and B, makes out that we have political capital that we don't have. And talking about capitals, we can't help but talk about Caracas and the ongoing Venezuelan crisis. Nice segue. Hats off to the leader of the Green Party of the US, Jill Stein, for pointing out the hypocrisy of, after years of official warnings by various federal agencies and the US government, that foreign actors could hack into and disrupt the power grid in the US. The US's response to the Venezuelan leader, well, one of them, Nicolas Maduro, claiming this has happened in Venezuela, has been to say, it's a vapid conspiracy theory. Now, it might be. After all, years of underinvestment into your electrical grid will come home to roost eventually. But if you've just spent the last couple of years scaremongering about power grid hacking at home, 
kind of behooves you to at least consider the possibility overseas, especially in light of the fact that the National Assembly in Venezuela drafted a bill in 2016 which provided amnesty for sabotage of the national grid. How would you like them apples? I don't like them apples at all. Them, them seem to be quite suspicious apples. Quite they frankly. are. They, they're not good green apples. They're suspiciously green mm. apples. Providing amnesty for sabotage of the national grid before your national grid goes down is almost as suspicious as claiming that you're not a vampire, despite returning from Romania, where all vampires live and come from. That's just racist against vampires. And Romanians. Yes. Moving on, finally... Finally, we can't help but mention Operation Varsity Blues, which I'm fairly sure is the theme tune to the Cheers spin-off, Frasier. Uh, but it also turns out to be a massive criminal conspiracy by actors and CEOs to get their children into elite colleges and universities. How? By faking their children's SAT scores. Um, Operation Varsity Blues actually takes its name from a 90s high school football comedy starring James Van Der Beek. Not bad, actually. Not I a actually bad don't film. think I've seen Varsity Blues. No, I don't like... But I do. I do know him well from Don't Trust the Bitch oh, in Apartment 23, where James Van Der Beek plays James Van Der Beek. Mm. The best James Van Der Beek impression ever put down on cell celluloid, true. although I assume it was actually filmed on digital. In fact, not even filmed, it was videoed on digital. Hmm. Although video really isn't what digital is anymore, it's just very confusing. It's very confusing. Well, I don't know any nomenclature about films anymore, or the point, digital. The point is Operation Varsity Blues, despite being a, a film about American high schools and American football, two things I'm not really interested in, was actually quite a good film. Uh, and also gave its name to this thing, uh, which has thus far implicated over 30 affluent parents, including CEOs and Hollywood celebrities, as well as college athletics coaches and more. The conspiracy also involved paying coaches enormous sums, half a million dollars in some cases, to get their children into schools by fabricating their athletic credentials. It's quite the conspiracy. It really is. And... It's been weirdly reported because one of the people behind paying for their children to get into school is, now I've forgotten her name, partner of William H. Macy? Uh, Felicity was, Huffman. Yes, yeah, see, I've now committed the cardinal sin I was going to accuse the media of, of fronting all of the stories about Felicity Huffman by only referring to her as wife mm. of William H. Macy, although the best one was William H. Macy turned 69 as wife is arrested for fraud. Really okay. fronting the story mm. in a really mm. unusual way. Mm. Yes, it's it's um and and especially when people have basically said you know why 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 spend millions of dollars sort of cheating your way into an exam into a university when you could just give the university millions of dollars to let your child in by way of a donation or making them like there was one person who literally said you know it's not like they just you know gave them a new building this is this is fraud. And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, I guess one's legal and one's not. But yeah, and actually, so much of a difference? something which we'll probably mention next week, but it's also now beginning to encompass Jared Kushner, because, of course, mm. Jared Kushner went to university and was not taken to be a remarkable student by his classmates. And at the time, there was suspicion that maybe his rich parents had greased the wheels and now people are revisiting that story. Mm, greasy wheels. Keep, stay tuned. So I think it's time to, to move on to the updates. Do you want to wanna hit us with a tune? To, I to do indeed. Hey, baby, I hear the blues are calling to salad and scrambled egg. Mercy. And maybe I seem a bit confused. Yeah, maybe, but... I got you, pet. Uh -oh. But I don't know what to do with those tossed salads and scrambled eggs. They're calling again. Poof, poof. Updates and retractions, everybody. Updates and retractions. You might recall that last year we talked a little about how agencies in Aotearoa, New Zealand, were using a private investigation firm, Thompson & Clark, to spy on all sorts of people illegally. One of those organisations was the New Zealand Police, who have now admitted that they forgot to investigate themselves over the matter. Police Deputy Commissioner of National Operations, Mike Clements, said... It is completely and utterly my fault. I didn't task it as I should have. It's been done now and the investigation shall commence, but there's no denying it's a month behind where it should be. Now, if you happen to be conspiratorially minded, you might think that's a very convenient excuse and ask whether, if members of the public and press 
hadn't followed up on the story, the police might have continued to forget about it for quite some time. Yes, and finally more MH370 news. We keep telling you when this gets resolved, we'll likely be out of a job. Uh, but fortunately for us, a new book, which came out last month, uh, in which um, author Ian Higgins details several hypotheses about what really happened, and one of them is quite a doozy. It's called the eloper by parachute theory, and it goes something like this. Captain Shah, one of the co-pilots, was a bit of a philanderer and was in an affair with someone called Rina. Rina was an heiress running the security scanners at Kuala Lumpur Airport. They planned to elope and start a new life, so Shah organised fake, pa fake passports and, crucially, parachutes. Once the plane was in the air, he depressurised the plane, raided the wallets of the dying passengers, then parachuted out with Rena to rendezvous with a fishing boat that was waiting for them. Higgins likes this theory because it's imaginative, and, and we can't deny that. Uh, maybe we should get a copy of this book for review purposes and, and review it, eh? I think that would be a really good idea. It will mm. certainly give us content for several episodes. I think it would. Moving on. Now, we have to issue a retraction to last week's breaking news. Milo Yiannopoulos has not been denied a visa to visit Australia. Well, he was going to have his visa denied. As such, it isn't really a retraction, but more of an update. Some of the more right-wing politicians, like Pauline Hanson, and opinion piece writers, like An Andrew Bolt in Australia, presented the news of the visa being denied and protested it, which led to the immigration minister reconsidering the matter. At this stage, Milo is allowed in Australia, which is both true and also a joke people in Australasia will get. Because mm. Milo is a kind of, kind of hot chocolate drink. Which is really yeah. only which known is an Australasian in... Australasian thing, yeah. And also South, Southeast Asia. Is it? Yeah. yeah. So it's that? really big in Singapore. Dang. Yeah. And in Malaysia. Well, if I'm ever journeying to... technically Singapore is part of Malaysia. Mm. So it's really big in Malaysia. There we go. If I'm ever journeying through there and I'm in the mood for a chocolate drink, I'll know what to ask for. Well, I won't because Milo contains milk products. Ah, well, yes. Which is odd because you often add it to milk. Mm, mm. It's the milk product you add to milk. Yes, I think Australia's uh, visa system seems to be every bit as unreliable as its prime ministership. As I, I say, mm. Australian visas are a magic eight ball. You just don't know what you're going to get next. Mm. Much like the prime minister. Their prime minister. Ours, ours, ours tend to be fairly stable. It's yeah. we, we, we go through leaders of opposition at a rate of knots. Yes, well, Australia goes through leaders of the leaders government. Leaders of the government, yes. But enough politics. Um, I think it's time to move on to the main part of our episode, which is all about Twitter. And sort of. conspiracy theories. Shock, hurrah. Well, I say it's about Twitter. It's not really about Twitter. It's from Twitter. It occurred Twitter. on it Twitter. It occurred on Twitter. The, the only, the last thing standing from um, the, the social media carnage of earlier this morning. I mean, Facebook and Instagram both went down for See, I use Facebook so rarely I had no idea it had gone down. Ah, well, there you go. No, it had, it had for a while in, in Instagram as well. I don't know if the two are related or what. But well, yeah. Facebook owns Do Instagram. They? I never yeah. know who owns who these days. Facebook also owns WhatsApp. Ah, they were, really? They have their own messaging app. Why would they want another one? It's, it's a very good question. Yeah. It's a very, very good question. Uh, but anyway, what didn't go down was Twitter. Which is good because our today's story comes there from. Um, so, the, but basically, on the tenth of March, uh, Dr. David Schiffman, who is a marine biologist, at and Simon, has a awesome Twitter handle, mm -hmm. Why, Sharks, Why Matter. Sharks Matter, marine biologist at Simon Fraser University, which is in Canada. Is it? I can't even remember. I looked it up and now I've forgotten. Uh, who has, yes, the excellent Twitter handle, Why Sharks Matter. Um, he tweeted out, Scientists, what's the weirdest, most illogical conspiracy theory you deal with in your area of expertise? One that I deal with a lot is belief that a large extinct fish is not really extinct and that the government and the scientific community is lying about this. And then uh, posted a gif from the, the Jason Statham movie, The Meg which involves a megalodon, so I assume that's what he was hinting at. Conspiracies in marine biology to deny the existence of the megalodon. Of giant fish. Mm. Although, actually, there are more giant things being denied, as we'll find out. Mm. So this basically led to a whole bunch of scientists on Twitter, and also people in the humanities, social scientists, if you will, 
talking about the conspiracy theories that they get presented all the time when doing their own work, and we thought it would be quite interesting slash amusing to go through and talk about some of the theories they discuss in this Twitter thread. Yes, and, and, and there are quite a few. I mean, there are quite a few things that didn't really count as conspiracy theories. They were just things that people tended to get wrong and mistaken assumptions and what have you. But um, And as we'll see, I think there are quite a few ones that we, we've heard before. But uh, supposedly, uh, quite a long list of conspiracy theories that these scientists are exposed to. So... Um, we have a big long list that's basically in chronological order of when they popped up on the Twitter feed, so should we just go top to bottom, or with any I particular so. ones you wanted to jump out I'm, of? I'm quite fond of going top to bottom in matters like that. Excellent. Well, the first one then was the claim that stone blocks are so hard to move, people could only have built Stonehenge and so on with help from ancient aliens or the technology of a lost civilization. One we've talked about plenty before, your lost civilizations and so on, and, and especially the sort of condescending colonial kind of attitude. Yes, because that those, those brown skin people. Mm. They could hardly have moved those rocks from one location to another. Now we, pale skinned people, we could build cathedrals, but brown skinned people, they definitely couldn't put one rock on top of another. That's just ludicrous and also quite, quite racist. Mm. Yes, I, I was reading, it might have been in reply to this thread or it might have been somewhere else, people talking about the Moai statues on, on Easter Island, Rapa Nui, um, which that sort of some sort of the, the, the folk history of them was that they had walked into place and then other people had shown out that, that if you wanted to transport a big statue like that, a good thing to do would be basically to walk it like when you're shuffling a refrigerator along or something. So that was entirely possible. And a fun fact about the Moai on Rapa Nui, even though they're known for their giant, giant heads, they actually do have tiny little bodies beneath mm. them. Just that those are the bits which are buried beneath ground. Yes. Which is amusing because for those people who follow the Celtic New Zealand thesis, people use the Moai statues to talk about the morphological differences between Polynesians and Europeans to make the claim that Polynesians have this thing called a rocker jaw, which is a form of jaw that many humans have. And they go, look, these statues are anatomical proof that Polynesians are different from Europeans but they do tend to ignore the giant head, tiny, tiny mm. body thing, which kind of goes against their, their anatomical proof of the difference. Because yes. otherwise you'd expect Polynesians to have giant heads and tiny bodies, and that just ain't true. Mm. Yes, so then there was another one following that up was the idea that, that aliens or ancient astronauts are actually the ones responsible for any sort of ancient human achievements. Uh, building any sort of megalithic or monumental architecture, and also, of course, when the conspiracy theory comes in, that archaeologists are hiding that info to save their own reputations. Apparently, the Nephilim and giants show up in that a lot. Which well. is the which is the biblical equivalent of the ancient alien yes. hypothesis that there was a race of giants living on the earth before the flood, and archaeologists who want to deny the truth of the Bible are hiding the evidence of Nephilim or giant civilization in order to further their secular stories. Mm. Uh, next, moving on to a, a, an area more, more along the lines of volcanology or possibly climatology, the idea that volcanoes produce more carbon dioxide than humans annually. Do they or don't they? I didn't quite know what that person was getting at there. So volcanoes do produce a mm. lot of CO2 and is a common trope in certain anthropogenic climate change conspiracy theories say, look, volcanoes and the sun are responsible for what's going on, not human beings. But we kind of have a fairly good idea that volcanoes, when they erupt, produce a lot of CO2. But on average, on a day-to-day -day basis, humans are the main driver of climate change. Mm. Same person also counters the theory that Yellowstone will kill us all at any minute, which isn't really a conspiracy theory. Um, I understand. I mean, there is the, the Yellowstone caldera. If it goes up, it's gonna gonna make a mark. Um, and you every now and then hear news reports saying, and it's overdue for an eruption. But apparently, that it is not overdue for an eruption. It's, it's, it won't be overdue for another for tens of thousands of years, I think. And given that most most volcanic systems aren't particularly predictable, mm. all they're saying is that the last time there was an eruption was X number of years ago, and we think there's a cycle, but we don't actually know because volcanoes just don't work that way. Mm. 
Did you ever read The Long Earth series by Terry Pratchett and Stephen Baxter? I did not. Ah, it's a, one of those books. It's a, a series where um, it's a sort of a science fiction-y one where it's discovered that our Earth is one in a sort of potentially infinite series of parallel Earths and they invent this device that lets people step from one Earth to another. Um, and at one point, at, at one of the books on, on sort of the original Earth where humans evolved, um, as, as our, our Earth appears to be unique in that it's the only one where human beings evolved, all the other ones there are some other species but mostly they're devoid of intelligent life. Uh, and one of them on, on original Earth, uh, the Yellowstone Caldera erupts, which means there has to be a mass evacuation into parallel Earths. Uh, which is all quite interesting, and it's it's an interesting series, but it's always a little bit. Um, it's kind of like here's an interesting implication of of if there were um, infinite parallel Earths, and some of that is interesting. Are you going to go anywhere? No, it's just an interesting thing to look at, and and it always it always just sort of just peters out a little bit without ever the story going anywhere. It's just hey, how, here's a cool concept. How many books were released before uh, Pratchett died? Uh, there, there's five or six in the series, and the last one or two were released after he died. So it was mostly Stephen Baxter writing think, those ones. I think, yes, yeah. Anyway, uh, moving on. Do you want to take a couple? One of the weirdest professional experiences I've ever had, this person writes, hands down, is being told the deep sea vent tube worms, which I brought back and kept alive in the lab, were the souls of the damned per Leviticus, I think. Not so much Not exactly a, conspiracy a conspiracy theory, theory but, but a pretty good story nonetheless. It sure is, yes. And another one, the best one I ever ran into was a guy who claimed the sun used to be brighter when he was growing up. I never used to be able to look at the sun, but now I can practically look right at it. He squints into the sky. It was cloudy. Once again, not actually a conspiracy theory. Although I suppose it's a conspiracy theory and you're talking to someone who probably deals with climatology mm. and going, well, you know... You know, it used to be much brighter. What are you people covering up about what happened to the sun, the real cause of climate change? I do remember mentioning ages, ages ago uh, a YouTube video I saw. I don't think I ever went back and actually found it to put a link to it, where a woman, it's a, a video on YouTube, where a woman goes out into her backyard where her lawn sprinklers are spraying water across the lawn and films the rainbow that forms in, in the water droplets and claims that you never used to get rainbows in, in the water spray sprinklers like this when I was young and I want to know what's the government putting in our water that makes rainbows appear in the water. I remember seeing that YouTube mm. video and also the the widespread mockery mm. that she got with yes. people pointing out that people going to waterfalls have reported seeing rainbows for a very long time. Mm. Mm. Uh, what else? Uh, desert tortoises. Now this this is actually a bit of a theme. We'll see this pop up from time to time. The idea of uh, various animal species being introduced by stealth into different areas for nefarious purposes. Well, and th in this case, mm. introduced into Utah by the federal government as an opening move in the invasion and eventual internment, internment and extermination of Mormons. Don't quite see the link between desert tortoises and Mormons. Nor do I, and I've never heard this theory before, and I do feel that we should look into mm. this one in more depth, because... First they come for the tortoises, then they come for the Mormons? Well, no, first they introduce the tortoises, they and then the tortoises they come to for the, the Mormons. Mormons. Maybe they're really, really persuasive tortoises who I mean, convince the Mormons to move into I mean, there's a terrible joke about having own. sex with animals here, and polyamorous marriages in Mormonism, mm. and I'm just not going I to go know. there. I was thinking more, maybe they'll all flip themselves up onto their backs. And the, Mormon the Mormons or the tortoises? The tortoises, and then when the Mormons encounter them, it'll be some sort of real life no, boot camp No, 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 see, see, these and tortoises are like face huggers. They flip onto their back. The Mormons go, oh, you poor tortoises, lean over, boom, face hugger on face, implants a non-Mormon in their stomach, non-Mormon bursts out, kills the Norman. The, the Norman kills the Norman and the Mormon, thus eradicating Normans and Mormons from Utah. Right. That doesn't make a lot of sense, but I feel it probably makes more sense than the actual theory Free that that one was born of. Uh, now, here's one. A faked moon landing is the most obvious one, which would have involved thousands upon thousands of people worldwide to cover up and was faked six times with one faked in space failure. Now, 
Obviously, we've talked about moon landing conspiracy. But I do before. kind of have an issue with the involved thousands upon thousands of people because depending on the scale of the deceit, it could be done with a small number of mm. people. Just Stanley Kubrick and a few of his crew. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, you have to work out whether the witnesses who claim to see the launches are part of the story mm. or whether that was faked in front of them. And then you're getting into the Michelin web sketch about it would be easier to go to the moon than it would be to fake going to the moon and launching a rocket to fool a crowd of people. Mm. So what's next door? A vet. A vet med here. Apparently there are many anti-vaxxers when it comes to vaccinating pets. Uh, recently a huge push in them, from them in regards to this idea that vaccines cause autism in cats and dogs uh, and somehow vets are getting rich off their 10 to $12 vaccines. Well, there's a story a few years ago about a couple in Aotearoa, New Zealand, claiming that a vet gave their budgie autism, which then did lead to questions as to how do you know your budgie is autistic. Mm, yes, what does autism look like in a... In a, in a non-human. Yeah. Mm. But yes, there are there are a lot of anti-vax theories in amongst Vaccine, people who own pets. Vaccines in the news here in New Zealand at the moment, given that there's been a couple of measles outbreaks around. Now, you and I are of the age that we didn't get the booster shot automatically. Apparently, but we're also of the age where if a family friend got measles, we'd have a measles party. Yeah, I, did, I, no, I, I didn't have a measles party. Apparently I did. I mean, mm. I, I, I remember the chicken pox party when I got the chicken pox. Apparently I also went to a measles party and got the measles. Mm. So, frankly, I'm fine. Yes, no, I, don't, I, I have gone spotty several times in my life. I don't know if one of those was measles or not. Because if you had, have had measles, you have antibodies, and you don't need the booster... But if you didn't, you do need the booster because people born from the late 60s to the early 80s or something, the, the booster shot wasn't part of the regular vaccination schedule. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So I, I apparently I've, I've had measles. Well, there you go. You Woohoo right me. There. Also, what a society we lived in where, oh, your child's sick with the measles. Let's infect all of our children. That's a great idea. That was a terrible idea mm. and they should never have done it. No. Uh, moving on. Now we have a cartographer. Um, and surprisingly, they get a lot of flat earther conspiracy theories. Uh, this person writes, flat earthers are challenging in the same way that a four-year-old asking you why is. Doesn't matter how well you can explain Eratosthenes and satellites, at some point knowledge relies on trusting smart people you've never met, and you go crazy. Which, Which is, actually yeah. is a legitimate issue to talk about, because, yes, in most situations, even people who are professionals in their field are going, well, I've never actually done the experiment myself. I've read about it in a book or read it in a journal. And he goes, ah, but how would you know that experiment occurred? And you go, well, I kind of trust the peer review. Ah, oh, you're part of the conspiracy. You trust the mm. whole peer review thing, do you? And it is actually something which is quite hard to argue against because you're dealing with someone who assumes that there's something rotten at the heart of peer review and the scientific method and consensus science, then appealing to consensus science doesn't actually do anything. Mm. And I mean, yes, all you could really do on that point, I suppose, is turn it back around on them and say that their, their beliefs are also on an equally shaky foundation, but that doesn't really get you anywhere, does no, it? No, it just means, but you, but you, but you, but you, and mm. it just all ends very badly. Right, tell me about earthquakes. Scientists are hiding earthquakes or downgrading the magnitude of large earthquakes to advance some bizarre agenda, and all sorts of weird things cause earthquakes, heart, sunspots, weather, mercury and retrograde, and scientists know but either won't do anything about it or two are covering it up, and then to what end? Mm. Yeah, one of the common threads through here, it seems, is scientists are covering this up for reasons. Now, we've actually had our own version of the earthquake conspiracy theory after the 2011 Canterbury Christchurch earthquake, where Ken Ring, who is a... I think we can call him a mathematician. Mm but also someone who engages in predicting the weather based upon the movement of the moon, claimed that he was able to predict earthquakes and that scientists are denying his mathematical skill and the fact the moon is the deciding factor for volcanology and earthquakes in general. 
and thus they're part of a massive cover-up to deny people like him their rightful place in the pantheon of science. Yes, as I recall, Ken Ring's thing was that he, he would say it's going to be on this date or sometime two weeks before or two weeks after. He'd sort of give himself yes. a range of a month yeah. or so. And it turns out that the incidence levels of earthquakes in Christchurch kind of fit into every two weeks there's going to be a quake of some kind, mm. which you means that Ken Ring right. is automatically right if his prediction is couched in a week and a half either side. Mm. So, uh, one person who don't, didn't say what field they work in, I think, but uh, th their weirdest conspiracy theory is that birds aren't real. They're government surveillance drones. Uh, truly, that's what these folks think, or at least that's what they say on the t-shirts they sell. Now, I can understand doing the birds aren't real now hypothesis, given the discussion about China building bird-shaped drones, which turns out to not be the threat it is. It's a prototype thing that China's engaged in and building drones that look like birds. But we've got an awful lot of descriptions and drawings and carvings of birds throughout human history. Mm. So that's the bit I... Are they saying that birds now are drones or birds have always been drones? Yes, I don't know. Maybe... Maybe that's just just phrased a little bit bluntly and they don't believe all birds are actually drones. Maybe just there are birds which are which actually are government drones. drones. I don't know. Now, here's a standard one. Yep. There's a cure for cancer and Big Pharma is suppressing it because chemotherapy is more profitable. We've talked about this one before. I can't remember, can't remember which number episode, but we've definitely done the cancer thing and we've definitely done the, the um, treatment is more profitable than cure angle that people always seem to come across, which... I don't know. I mean, do, do we have actual evidence of people, of companies, you know, poss potentially slowing down cures because they can make more money well, from treatment? So what we do have evidence of is that the fact that companies don't publish null results, so when they do experiments on drugs and trials, they tend to only publish the trials which are successful and shelve any reports of drugs that don't work or produce the wrong results. And in that respect, you can kind of see there being a conspiracy by the pharmacological community to slow things down. Because if you published bad, no results or bad results, people would go, oh, well, we don't need to do that experiment. We know drug X doesn't do what we want it to do. So in that respect, you can kind of see, well, maybe, maybe they are sitting on unsuccessful drugs that could be used for something, but they're not publishing those results. That's a plausible thing to believe. Mm. The notion that it would be more profitable for existing treatments over new treatments coming out kind of flies in the face of new treatments coming out all the time. Yes, well, I think the argument is, is something which cured the disease completely is less profitable because you take the cure and you don't need any more drugs, whereas something which treats the disease but doesn't actually get rid of it means those people are going to keep giving you drugs forever. I think it's possibly just a statement on late-stage capitalism that you can you can imagine a company making that yeah, sort of decision. That's, that's yeah. true. And I mean, I suppose the counterpoint to that is we keep on finding more diseases to treat. I mean, one mm. of the big complaints about the DSM-5 is that they keep on finding more and more things you can use drugs to treat. Mm. So you can afford to cure some diseases because there are 15, for every one you cure, there are 15 more you can treat with brand new drugs. Well, there you go. Drugs. They're awesome. Not really. No. Sometimes. I don't know. Uh, so, moving on, um, again, not, not wasn't clear which field this person works in, but the, their conspiracy is that, that we make up problems, like that species or populations are endangered, so that we can apply for grants and get rich off them. I think this, this is sort of a common thing, isn't it? That yeah, it's scientists are just in it for the money, theories, yeah. in it for the research grants, which is kind of like the idea that people have lots of children for the welfare checks. I don't think the economics of it actually works out. I mean, the, the thing which is... The only kernel of truth to this particular kind of conspiracy theory is that it is true that there are certain avenues of research which are in vogue at any particular point in time. So if you're doing physics, you want to be doing string theory. If you're engaged in atmospheric physics, you want to be doing cli climatology. 
if you're doing philosophy, then there's a lot of stuff in philosophy of mind and philosophy of language, which is kind of the big stuff where it's easy to get postdocs and grants. So it is true that people tailor their research to where the research funding is, but you don't have to actually invent problems to get that funding. You just have to specialize in where the funding exists. And that tends to be that the people who are giving out grants are the people who are doing research in that area 20 to 30 years ago. So it's just institutionalization. It's not the invention of issues. It's the cementing of, well, I'm famous, I did X, and I've got my hand on the purse strings, so I'm going to give money to people to do X as well. Mm. It's not a conspiracy. It is just late-stage capitalism. Yes. So moving on, uh, this is a good one, that wildlife management agencies want to bring back predators so they'll kill all the game so people won't be able to hunt them, and then we can take away everybody's guns! First of all, I assume by predators they simply mean predatory animal species and not predators from the movie Predator. Although that would, I would be, be awesome. fully in favour of that. But yeah, that, that's quite a, quite, a, quite a good chain they've got going there. Bring back predatory species, kill all the game, stop people hunting, take guns! It's actually, it's the, it's the underpants, no, blah, 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 question mark, profit, but they've actually filled in the question mark step. Except that, as we're seeing in certain parts of Europe where they brought back wolves, now they've got too many wolves. Mm. And so they're now thinking we might do some culling of wolves. wolves yes. And who are they asking to do the culls? Hunters. And with what weaponry? Guns. Mm. Uh, and then somebody else replied to that one, that's directly at odds with the animal rights one. I've heard that FWS, I, I assume that's the American agency in something wildlife service, possibly, fe possibly. federal wildlife service, yep. whatever, uh, purposely man man manipulates deer populations to justify selling more hunting licenses for the money. So here we have one conspiracy theory saying that, no, the government's not trying to kill off game species, they're trying to grow game species to make more money off of those sweet, sweet hunting licenses. Well, I mean, that was one of the issues we had with possum here. In the old days, we had a kind of bounty on them. So possums are a pest. In, in New Zealand, yeah. yep. So they had a bounty on them that if hunters went out, uh, killed and trapped them and brought back their skins, then they would get a bounty on the notion that would wipe out the possum species. Hunters very quickly worked out that wiping out the species would actually mean not making any money no from skinning them. Yeah. So they would keep a breeding population alive in certain areas. And so it didn't actually solve the problem, it just cemented it. Yes, that was, speaking of Terry Pratchett again, that was in one of the Discworld books, wasn't it? Where they had a, yeah. a rat problem in Angmore Pork, so they put a bounty on the rats, but then they found they had more rats than ever, so Veterinary just said, tax the rat farms. Uh, oh, now, this is one I hadn't actually heard of before. Uh, concave hollow earth theory, obviously your hollow earth theory has come up, but the idea that the earth is hollow and we live on the inside. Yes, and the sun is at the, the centre. Yes, I, yeah. have, I have read about this particular theory. There are all sorts of theories about optics to explain why horizons appear to curve away from us as opposed to up. Like the, like the city in Inception. Yeah. Mm. So, but yes, there are people who believe there is a hollow earth and we live on the centre, and it's the chuds who actually live on the outside. Damn, they're not cannibal it's... underground dwellers, they're cannibal they're the overworld dwellers. dwellers. Childs. Childs. It's even worse. Indeed. So one person says, the craziest, though, that they had seen was a paper written in pencil with equations, etc., which purported to prove that thunderstorms were living and sentient beings who communicated using th lightning and thunder. This is actually harder to disprove than chemtrails, I think. Once again, not really, not a, really conspiracy a conspiracy theory. theory no, unless people uh, are deliberately I would like it. to see these calculations. Mm, mm. What else we got? My favourite was the guy, I'm, and I'm reading directly here, so not saying my favourite, yeah. but the person who wrote this. My favourite was the guy who got up in a public hearing claiming that the UN black helicopters were bringing dead aliens and radways to be buried at the landfill I worked at every Saturday at midnight. He'd seen it through his night vision goggles and had tried to shoot the helicopter. He had a lot of support for this, claimed we, the largest waste services provider in North America, were run by the UN, and that I personally was hiding the groundwater data showing the proof of the aliens' rad waste since all the landfills leak, which is another bit of BS. A lot of people brought into this. He was a rather persuasive public speaker. He had photos of oil-stained gravel to prove this. Well, here's, here's your actual conspiracy theory. So good on this guy for starters. Um... 
But yeah, the government burying dead aliens in radioactive waste is basically the plot line to the TV series War of the Worlds based on the 1958 film War of the Worlds. So the premise in War of the Worlds, the TV series, is there was an invasion on Earth in 1958, and the aliens a la the book were killed by bacteria. Except they actually weren't killed, they went into a state of hibernation. The US military did some experiments on the bodies initially, but due to a kind of weird telepathic virus thing, people began to forget about the invasion, and the scientists eventually put the alien bodies into steel cans, and they were just being moved around from place to place, and eventually they end up in a radioactive waste site, which then kills the bacteria on the aliens rejuvenating them, thus giving you the plot for War of the Worlds Season 1. Mm. Was it any so, good? Yes and no. It's one of those late 80s science fiction shows, which is probably very hard to watch now. But if you caught it at midnight on TV, it was kind of perfect. Mm, nice. And they, the aliens themselves were delightfully weird. So their technology made no sense. And the way they talked was very cryptic and obscure. They really did sell the notion that these aliens are not like us. Hmm. Uh, well, moving on, we have another, what I assume is another um, marine biologist who claims they've heard the theory that dolphins are able to use telepathy to help us communicate with secret alien overlords who exert authority by kidnapping people into sexual slavery. Psychic dolphins, alien sexual slavery? Well, it's kind of a mixture of a whole bunch mm. of conspiracy theories from the 70s and 80s. There's all that experimentation into dolphin communication, uh, right down to the point of giving dolphins a LSD, which it turns out to be a really bad thing because it kills them. Mm. And then, of course, the whole pedophile network, which is still an ongoing conspiracy theory to this day. Yes. But dolphins in control of us, it's almost Douglas Adams-esque. Mm. Mm. Now, this, now, I'm sure we've talked about this before. Uh, this person says their favourite is, there are no forests. The idea that plateaus, mesas, flat-top mountains, etc. are the petrified remains of true ancient forests of giant trees taller than mountains, and what we think of as current forests are basically just bushes. I'm sure we have talked about this before. We, although I don't, we, I don't think we've ever devoted an episode no, no, to the forests up. aren't real conspiracy mm. theory. But yes, there are people who believe that the things we call forests today are basically just widespread shrubs. And that real forests are kind of giant, kilometre-tall trees. And they've been wiped out in a hitherto undiscussed calamity, sometimes identified with the flood. Yes, yeah, so I was going to say it sounds kind of biblical, giant trees to go with your yeah. giants and your Nephilim and what have you. But the actual evidence for this tends to be flat-topped mountains. So people go, I don't understand why that mountain has no top. Normally why mountains don't have, the, don't have a top was that at some point in history a glacier carved the top off. And they go, well, that... It, it makes no sense, but it does look like the base of a tree. Mm. Oh, I think I have solved it. It's actually not a mountain, it's a tree stump. Mm. And that was kind of it. There are a bunch more in the in the government agency secretly introducing species. Some people talked about them introducing cougars into different areas. Some people talked about them dropping cottonmouth snakes, wolves. I think elk came up at one point. And it, again, it was always fairly fairly poorly defined reasons exactly why the government was secretly introducing um, introducing animals into areas. Although, wasn't there a story in the news the other day about people parachuting wolves into areas to control the elk population? <laughs> so, that's just this vision of a wolf in, in camo well, and a helmet. Right, your, your task, Wolfie, is to, is to get on down there and remove those elk from that population. Well, yeah, so people were sort of imagining some elk standing around in the, in the forest going, well, everything seems safe around here, just going to stop and let my defences down, and then looks up and, oh, for God's sake, yeah, it's a parachuting wolf. Now, I do want to make one point here. So... Mm. The term conspiracy theory in this Twitter thread is very pejorative. Oh, yes, yes. And 
It's also quite possible that the descriptions we're getting of these conspiracy theories, which we've been making fun of in this episode, are simply people who think that no conspiracy theory can ever be true, and thus giving all these theories short shrift. So it's possible that the people who are expressing these things had better evidence, or at least more interesting arguments as presented here. But at the same time, a lot Psychic of dolphin, these, alien sex yeah, a lot of these mm. are conspiracy theories we've kind of heard before, and kind of conspiracy theories that people do seem to have good reason to think, yeah, that one doesn't sound particularly plausible. Oh, yes. And in, indeed, in fairness, um, the original tweet was, what's the weirdest, most illogical conspiracy Yes, theory? that's true. Yeah, that's that's true. So, um, so I guess finally, what in your industry, what's the we weirdest conspiracy theory you've come across? Is it just more of the academics? Well, no, it's more like it people, yeah, people like me are being paid by governments. Jazz Coleman. Thesis. Yeah, yes. Jazz Coleman accused me of working for unspecified powers, being paid large sums of money to present what he claimed to be a refutation of belief in conspiracy theories entirely, which A, showed he had no idea what I actually do, and B, if government is giving me money, they haven't told me which bank account they're putting it into because I haven't found it yet. Mm. So basically... Most of the conspiracy theories that I encounter are conspiracy theories about me. Yes. I, I couldn't really think of any. I work in the software industry. I work for a company that makes accounting software. Um, so, I mean, if, if, you, if you brought an accounting into the wider financial world, there's lots of sort of Jews control the world, George Soros stuff out there. But um, not a lot in, my, in, in my workplace, I've seen some. Uh, one guy who no longer works with us was, was quite pro-Trump leading up to the 2016 election and occasionally would say things like, um, oh, yes, no, I mean, Hillary Clinton is known to have had 30 different people killed, but no, let's make fun of Trump because of his silly hair. And it was like, really, Trump, Hillary Clinton death count stuff? You're going with that? Okay. And I once overheard a conversation again leading up to the 2016 election between two other guys um, where one of them was, was educating the other one in the New World Order and how Trump's good because Hillary's all for the New World Order, but Trump's against it. But uh, nothing, nothing specific to any particular industry there, just some people who happen to like conspiracy theories. Well, I suppose in the world of software engineering, you do get your notches. And your people well, you like do. that. Yes, yes, your people who are, who are very clever people who've, um, and I suppose this isn't specific to software, but, but in, in any place you get very clever people who've managed to do one thing very, very well and think that that makes them experts on all other things. Which the is Richard Dawkins effect. Yes, yes. Someone who's very good at evolutionary biology, thus thinking he's also really good at the philosophy of religion when he's not. Yes, yeah, I, I see it in sort of in the art world as well a little bit. Writers who are very good at putting a sentence together think mistake that for being able to put a a, a good argument together. Yes, yes. Yeah. Your Dave Sims and yeah. Oh, Dave. Now we we could probably actually mm. do an entire episode. We must. On he Dave must have Sim. come up before Dave Sim. I don't think he has. So Dave Sim is the author of the rather famous comic book Cerebus, which was the first and only attempt to do a 30-year plot line in comics mm, from what to go, yeah, yeah, and has been completed. But about a third of the way through, Sim got into a very, very messy divorce from his wife, and then he found God, and then he became incredibly misogynistic, mm. and then it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. Yes, it, it sort of became a, a overtly misogynistic Jordan Peterson. It was it was not sort of men are order and women are chaos, and chaos isn't necessarily bad. You can't have order without chaos, even though the subtitle of my book is an antidote to chaos. Yeah, of well, chaos in the same case, anyway, men are form and women are void. Women are void. Men are light. Woman, uh, just not just shed. darkness, they absorb the, the, all yes, light. Soul sucking void. 
But enough about Dave Sim. Yes, I think we should talk about him another time. Yeah. So that's it. Uh, so I guess, first of all, we should say thank you very much uh, to Dr. David Schiffman, because he's given us, in a single tweet, he's given us an episode's worth of fun to talk about. Although it doesn't actually answer the Twitter handle, why sharks matter. Why do sharks matter? I don't know, because they're cool. They've got big, 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 lots of rows of teeth, and they eat stuff. And yet and you're like, scared of vampires. They're the world's greatest killers, probably. What about vampires? Vampire I mean, sharks. Obviously. That, that, yeah, that, that actually is quite a scary prospect. Yeah. Now, if you want to hang around yes. because you're a patron or want to become a patron, in the bonus episode, we'll be talking about the fake Melania conspiracy theory as well as an interesting comparison between David Hogg, survivor of the Parkland shooting, and Adam Lanza, the massacre shooter of Sandy Hook. Interesting little story there. We'll be touching on the fact that Chelsea Manning is back in jail, and we'll be talking about the fact that Amazon is selling books that suggest that you can cure autism with bleach. Mm. Fun times. Fun times. So, uh, if you are one of our pa Patreons, Patrons, whatever it is we're supposed to call you. Uh, our favourite human beings, as we always like to say. Uh, stay tuned for that coming up. If you're not one of our patrons, you're, 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 you're among our favourite human beings as well. Because but you're you can to be favourited mm. or favourite... Fa Fav favourited? Favourited. Favourited? Is you can be favourited by just giving us a, a couple of mm. bucks a month and you'll get access to the bonus content. We've been told by no one entirely... It's pretty good. Mm, mm. Uh, but yes, if, if you're not, then it's it's then it's goodbye for us right now. Um, otherwise, it's see you soon. La rivedere. You've been listening to the podcaster's guide to the conspiracy, starring Josh Addison and Dr. M. R. X. Dentist which is written, researched, recorded, and produced by Josh and M. You can support the podcast by becoming a patron via its Podbean or Patreon campaigns. And if you need to get in contact with either Josh or M, you can email them at podcastconspiracy at gmail.com or check their Twitter accounts, Monkey Fluids and Conspiracism. It's just a step to the left.